Welcome to Clothing Culture, a fashion industry podcast at the intersection of technology and innovation. I'm Emily Lane. And I'm Brett Schnitger. We speak with experts and disruptors who are moving the industry forward. And discuss solutions to real industry challenges. Clothing Culture is brought to you by Stars Design Group, a global design and production house with more than 30 years of experience. Welcome back to another episode of Clothing Culture. Brett and I are back once again in the great city of New York City. Isn't it wonderful to be here? It is. It's wonderful. I feel like we've had so many inspiring conversations, and I have been so incredibly eager and joyous about the conversation that we are going to have today. We are joined by Nicole Fichalis, who is a goddess of the industry. No, I'm not. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Known for being a champion of many major designers. My, one of my favorites, Alexander McQueen. Oh, yes. Oh, Christian Lacroix, Chloe, uh, Jeremy Scott. And you had a very illustrious career with Saks Avenue, Ferragamo, and Macy's. My goodness, Nicole, what have you not done, accomplished in your career? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> There's always more to do. Yes, absolutely. Yes, especially when you love it. Oui. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So there's so many things that we could explore in our conversation. But one of the things I'd, I'd like to begin with is, you know, these, these wonderful icons that you identified earlier in their career and helped pave a way for their their career to, to launch. Tell us a little bit about what it was you saw in these designers that you just knew would resonate with the world. I think the unexpected. I think most of the people I, I discovered at the beginning of their career was always a big surprise and a, a sort of a joy because it, it was a, a whole different approach, a whole different mood, uh, and, and they, they were unique, and they were individualistic, and they were joyful, and they were very, very strong uh, personalities, usually, in their uh, conviction about where they, what they were doing, not necessarily knowing where they were going, but having a lot of uh, personality and kindness, and uh, that's it. You spoke previously, before we hopped on this conversation on the podcast, about really trusting your instincts when you're when you're meeting uh, designers, when you're looking at that instinct, is it really about you know who that person is, or is it about the talent, or is it really this kind of holistic idea? Okay, so you know it's a combination of things, and it 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 evolves. It's never the same. You know, it can be the clothes, and you don't see the designer, but the clothes are so interesting and beautifully made and and have a color appeal or a, or new proportion you know i will never forget the first time i saw the clothes for instance of thierry mugler do you mm -hmm. want to hear that yes. yeah the uh, i you know i was running Saks fifth avenue in the paris buying office initially i worked there that's how i started mm -hmm. my career and uh, one day a rep called me and said, Nicole, I must show you something. I said, okay, come show me. She come with a suitcase. She put the suitcase on my desk and she pulls out those amazing Thierry Mugler jacket mm -hmm. with the shoulder, the seaming, the peplum, the color of it, the cut of it. I was completely blown away. I had never seen anything like that. Mm -hmm. And um, Sachs came for the collection a few weeks later, and we bought the line right away, exclusively. He was not even, you know, making such incredible fashion show at the time. Hmm. So, so it depends, but, but it's a combination of seeing the personality of the designer and the clothes. Yeah. I mean, you know, when Lagerfeld did Chloe, you know, I used to go to, to I used to, to do even the, the, the trunk show 
at the time for, for uh, Sachs with Chloe, because the Chloe owners didn't want to hear anything, had never heard what a trunk show is, were not going to send the collection <laughs> with anybody. And that's how I started to uh, travel to the, through the States with the Chloe collection and Carl coming for some of the uh, launch or special event, etc., with Chloe. And, oh my goodness. you know, it, it was a very easy way to, uh, to see the clothes being even produced when they were working on fabric, on, on, on sketches before, because Saks was their number one client in, U, in the US. And then I met Christian Lacroix when he was doing the collection of Jean Patou. Mm -hmm. And again, it was so explosive and different and cheerful. And I said to Christian one day, I said, you know, you should have your own collection. You should make your own house. And the chairman of uh, Jean Patou was told that I said that to his designer. Uh oh. <laughs> and a, a few months later, we had a major meeting with the head of Saks. And he said to them, how dare of Nicole Fischditz to say that <laughs> to our designer. <laughs> but sure enough, the designer opened his own company. And uh, we were very uh, friendly. And the, 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 what he did has never been reproduced by anybody in the world. I mean, there's all these was, silent faces. Behind I, I will never the forget there. the first show, the model, the music the way they walked, the clothes, it was like a, an experience, mm -hmm. every single show. And, and, and Montana, Claude Montana was the same way. I discovered him in a little building in Le Sentier, which is like in Paris, used to be the, um, the ready to wear a little neighborhood. In a, I woke up five, sta five staircase in a tiny little building and I saw, I met Claude and he had those amazing clothes and, you know, I fell in love with the style and we bought it too. At the time, you know, uh, the store were very open to, to support and buy new designer and new collection. Yeah, it's it curation was, it of was, art. Yes. And that's that. I guess that's how I looked at it. You have, I, you know, I was. That's that's how why I met um, Alexander McQueen oh. at his very beginning. I was at the <laughs> first show of a French designer at the time, Jeremy Scott, mm -hmm. and at the end of the show, um, Susie Mankes came to me. You know, the very yes. famous, iconic journalist, and she said, Nicole. You and I are always in the most unexpected places looking at new collections. She said, are you going to London? I said, of course I'm going to London. I adored London because, and I still do, because it's always the unexpected and the individualism. Sure. And, and uh, she says, I want to t take you somewhere. I said, fine, let's do it. So after a show, she took me on the outskirts of London in her taxi and we get into this be beautiful old building and we go into a kind of a loft huge and there is this young guy seated on a bench <laughs> blushing Alexander McQueen oh my gosh and he showed me the first his clothes and I saw the first show in London. You know, it was a small show that was never the, uh, the, the unique, extravagant, beautiful event that he did through his whole career. And uh, I fell in love with his work and we bought it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think that we're rediscovering that in fashion today? I mean, over the years, I think, you know, designers had very few opportunities to be discovered because there were only so many portals you could be discovered through. Thankfully, they had a champion with you to bring well, that things over. that was not the and only one. Of I course mean, not. But, but you were a great example for someone that, that understood, I'm probably not the first person that says this, but I believe that designers are, you know, we try to compartmentalize some of these things and we think, oh, artists paint with oil and, and they paint on canvas. Look, Designers are artists, they just paint in fabric. And they have these 
perceptions. They have these focuses. They have these dreams and desires like everybody. And our, our industry has gone through this unique evolution. We went to this place where people like you discovered creative talent. We celebrated that. People wore it. Um, it was wearable art. And, and the key was is that they understood society around them, their view on society, and then people that bought their items were part of that club, if you will. Then we went through this place where I think our business became so commoditized. It's still this challenge with large volumes and fast fashion and trying to clothe the masses. And I think we, at one point, overall forgot about fashion as art. There was areas that it still was celebrated, but there was this drive for the bottom line. There was this drive for volume. And I think today we're rediscovering fashion as art again, where Definitely. there's a celebration. But also one of the very interesting uh, current is the influence of art into fashion. Agreed. Oh, yes. Uh, and fashion into art. Mm -hmm. there's, uh, but and, haven't they and always as you been? Say, Fashion is art. I mean, it's the They've art of been. craft. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And, and I think today what we're seeing in one of our previous episodes, we talk about the rise of the boutique brand industry. It's the fact that today, even though there's more noise than ever online, but there are these, and, and we've started dialoguing not nearly to the level that you have, but there's these amazing artists out there with vision and, and drive and desire. And there's an opportunity now for them to be seen. And I believe that consumers are starting to re-recognize um, the fascination that fashion has and that it is art and that these little niche brands are starting to come up again. And I would think in your career, life is getting exciting again. You're starting to see the opportunity. You know, we never stop looking, you know, as curators of art, as, as people that have been in the industry a long time, you know, you can't, you fall in love with the business and it never changes. You are, no matter what you're, what you're doing on a daily basis, you still are in love with, with this business. And are you finding today that there are, that there is this return to that passion? I think so. Yeah. I think there is a need for it. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think people need to find this uh, this form of of excitement and and uh, and dream and individualism. I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm not sure that the store fully support those movements because yes. I think eventually they want a, a profit. But, but can't both exist? I mean, when you talk to, about to sustainability. To my opinion, you know, when I, wa I was at Saks for 10 years in New York from 91 to 2001, and in those years, I was very lucky to work with two brilliant people. One was uh, um, Philip Miller, the chairman who made me come from Paris and move over, and he was previously the... Uh, the president of Neiman and then the chairman of Marshall Field. And I had helped him to get back the glamour of Field because Field had been, Marshall Field had been bought by the same company who owned Sachs. So we worked together. And then Rosemary Bravo was there as well as the president. And we were really a very strong team. We really worked together and, and uh, and my job there was not just, you know, being a fashion director and talking about forecast and trend. Uh, you know, I was very involved with marketing, with merchandising, with visual. And it was a very complete vision of wh where the store should be. And, uh, you know, if I w was in love with a collection, something new coming out, it, I have some instance where I would call... Uh, Miss Bravo from Paris and say, you know, the press is looking at so-and-so, it just came out, it's a, and she would say, leave me alone, just buy it. And I was not <laughs> yes. even the buyer. But that's the confidence. You know, you talk about mm -hmm. instinct. And, yeah. and I think one of the things that I've recognized in the, in the industry is that people like yourself, they have one finger on what the consumer is. You're very aware of the market and the consumer and the, and the 
the audience for the designer and you have one finger on the designer and their vision. And when you have the pulse on both sides of that fence, you have the ability to go, it's right for him or her. The time mm -hmm. is right for that person to come in. And I think that that is, you know, in as many years as I've been in it, I feel like it's almost a lost art. I feel like, you know, you talk about some stylists and people that you know of that are up and coming that you're finding really interesting, you know, taking the reins uh, and, and moving this forward. But I think the idea to be both a merchant and to have this curation from art at the same time is a very unique talent, you know, and the ability to do both. I think it, it, it allows the company like a gallery to be profitable and it allows the artist to be discovered. And you know, it, and it, it expand into many different area of the company, like visual, the windows. Yes. Mm -hmm. You put art in the window. Yeah. You integrate this in your photo shoot for your marketing and etc. So um, I think it's it's a, it's a, it's about a complete vision of what this retail business should be. Agreed. Mm -hmm. That's a very uh, experiential, you know, if you think about the windows and, and then you look at the photography and the storytelling sure. behind that. And, and, you know, you really, you are creating this, this idea of, of you want to have a part of that experience. You want to own a piece of that art. Yeah. You, you know, for instance, um, for instance, when uh, Mr. Saint Laurent came to New York to launch with Sachs his uh, champagne fragrance, the name had to be changed after uh, a few years, champagne. There was a huge one evening party in the store. And um, I asked some contemporary photographer to reshoot the original iconic style of Saint Laurent. So we had the original museum pieces in the window with a photo of the, of the pho pho current photographer. So we did, you know, the, the safari jacket, the Mondrian dress, etc. It was amazing. And when he came, he had a voice like, I will not forget. He looked at me and he went, my windows. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> When you, when you look at today, I think that for the years that you've been in this industry, there's this certain developed wisdom. Do you believe that, that there's been a change in the industry with COVID or with e-commerce? There's all these influences that, that were never and are, are heavily accelerating. Is there more opportunity, do you believe, for our industry than ever before? We're seeing a lot of consolidation going on. Or do you think that people have lost their way? Maybe it's a combination of I both. I, you know, I like to be positive. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think they are trying to find their way again. And I think because of the shrinking industry, they have to do that. Yeah. And, and there is no other way because yes, the online business has grown and exploded. But you know, the, the whole idea of touch and feel yeah, I agree. Cannot be replaced. You're right. There's something very sensual yeah. mm -hmm. about getting into a store and being being uh, taken by the charm of, of 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 the visual presentation and even the smell and the and and the sales associate and it's not like looking at something online and ordering. Uh, That's one of the challenges answer. that we talk I, about. All I the think time. it needs to to be you know special event and things like that as yeah. well. I think, you know, experiential retail is, is becoming more and more of a buzzword. People are talking about that. But it's actually kind of a return to the roots because retail at one point was always experiential. You of would course. walk in from the scent when you mm -hmm. walked in the door yeah. to the great customer service, to the curated windows. All of that we, went away for a while. And now they're kind of saying it's new concept and we, we discovered where it's... We. It's a big circle. And in between <laughs> so. you had, you know, all those amazing concept stores. Yeah. who came out, you know. Yeah. Mm. Shop. Yeah. And so I think, you know, as we as we start to rediscover, we talk about, you know, this tactile 
essence of clothing. And people are like, well, brick and mortar's gone. And I'm like, I'm even challenged with it. You know, one of the acquisitions we made this year, um, Inspire, which is an online platform developing, you know, collections with influencers. I still struggle with that because I, I'm like, you know, visually we can create beautiful ideas, but how do we, how do we, how do we wrestle Elevate with that the experience. fact yeah. that tactily, <laughs> yeah. it is this, we Don't in the garment feel. business love to pick up a piece of fabric and go, well, that that's feels right. amazing. We hate to pick up a fabric yes. and go, well, that's yeah. not right. But, yeah. you know, there, there is that essence. And so yeah. I don't believe brick and mortar will ever go away in this business. It's just going to evolve and maybe evolve in a big circle. You know, people have to rediscover that experience uh, uh, and the romance. I, I think of they're this trying business. to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I love how it is this kind of free time, you know, because there are these different moods and ideas that you're talking about, color and romanticism, and, oui. you know, so it really gives you a chance to um, dress to the moment, dress how you're feeling oui. and, and celebrate fashion in a different way. You know, we've spent a little time talking about designers that have had the it factor, but it's really clear to me, Nicole, that you yourself are someone that has the it factor. How, um, when did you know that fashion was your calling? You know, I was raised with parents that were, um, my father was a furrier, so I was, uh, and my brother took over the business, it's now my nephew, and my, my nephew, yes, third generation. So I was raised seeing him working on the canvas, on mm. the, on the cut, on the sewing with a worker in the atelier, etc. But I was taken every weekend. We used to go to museum and, uh, and, and I learned a lot about art and culture. My father loved the uh, history and the uh, architecture. And I was a, I was a good student, but, um, very young, <laughs> I decided I didn't want to study anymore. Mm -hmm. I was a real free spirit. <laughs> and I told my parents, I said, I want to work. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to, to study anymore. And, uh, and were they, they, were they supportive? Or? They, let, they supported yeah. me. Yeah. And I was introduced to uh, this buying office uh, in Paris. And the guy who, the, the man who runs the buying office said to my father's friend who introduced me, what are we going to do with this kid thinking <laughs> about me? And this kid was wa wearing, you know, very bright short mini skirt, etc. <laughs> I used to go to London for one day just to buy, <laughs> buy train, come back yeah, you that can, night. You can do that, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and I learned. I was lucky because in those years, the buyer at the office was also uh, representing stores like Whole Train Food in Canada and Neiman Marcus. So I worked with all those famous buyers who were themselves customers in a way and who knew everything about couture and workmanship. And they would take me around and show me the construction of the clothes. I would go in the couture atelier and I grew up like that. And I would, I would haunt every single fashion neighborhood in Paris and I would cover all the trade fair show and I was just passionate. Yeah, mm -hmm. we talk. We talk another they, show. And I grew, you know, I grew up the ladder. I yeah. mean, I work with many stores, and and then I I was responsible just for Saks. And in fact, Neiman and and Bergdorf got tired of seeing Nicole Fischtis finding all the best collection <laughs> and giving them exclusively <laughs> to to Saks. They they opened their own fashion of their own buying office. <laughs> it's the truth. Yeah. We, yeah. And then one day, you know, I, I became responsible to for Europe for Saks. And then one day, Phil Miller said to me. You know, there is a VP, fashion director position if you, in New York, open if you want, it's yours. Yeah. He was on his way back to New York. He was in his car in front of the Ritz. I looked at him and I said, why not? 
That's right. That's, and that was it. Yep. It's your adventurous spirit. It's yes. about doing it. But I was time. lucky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, well, I don't know if, I think you I created luck. You were passionate. You were driven. I totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Caroline on another podcast talks about the supportive mentors and that you mentored her through that. And I reminded her that we all had mentors. We all had people when we were at a stage in life that helped us get where we were. Well, I, you know, I've been speaking to a, to a lot of young rising designers through my career because uh, it's about giving also, right. you know? You, 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 it's one of the joy to see somebody go and be, go to the next level. Yeah. I was lucky to have that experience. And they need people to guide them. They need that help. And yeah. you've, you've understood over so many designers what made a designer work, what, mm -hmm. what collapsed a designer. We've heard those stories, people that would light up like a fire and go away. And, and, and I think having that pulse on that whole thing for the next generation of designers, the continual generations of designers that keep coming out, mentorship is really important. And I'm, congratulations We're for totally. doing that. I feel like I, I feel like in any way I can, I do the same thing. It's like, look, and my uh, wisdom you know, comes from making so many really mistakes. We don't really know that we are doing it. No. Because we're into uh, right. communication. Yes. And, uh, and the, which makes it even stronger because yeah. we are not like teaching or anything. We're just expressing our feeling and our point of view, but not mm -hmm. in a tutorial way, really. No, but it's an informed point of view. We've made mistakes. We, we, we're human beings. We yes. make mistakes and we do things that right. Yeah. And if you do enough of those over a couple yeah. of years, you develop wisdom and you can right. say, I've done it. Yeah. I thought it would work, but it doesn't, you know? Um, and I think that's fascinating today. I think that's the way it should be. Well, it has been wonderful to hear some of the insights into your, your history. Um, before we close this conversation, I would love to, um, ask you to share um, maybe a little wisdom for somebody who is an aspiring designer who is really interested in maybe catching the eyes of someone like yourself. What thoughts do you have to share? I would say follow your instinct. Hmm. Absolutely. And be humble. I think that's great advice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Nicole, for joining us today. It really is a dream to have no, you here. No, it's not so much. I enjoyed it. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, we hope to have many more conversations. Yeah, I hope so. Well, merci. And De rien. <laughs> no plaisir. <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe to Clothing Culture, the podcast, to stay apprised of new episodes. <laughs>